In fact, this was just recently confirmed by Van Langlen with live uh, X-ray three-dimensional analysis in Sweden where they actually showed where the rotation does occur. What they saw was a huge amount of rotation, the six degrees here in supination, very little rotation as it dropped, and at the very end of the range of motion, the tailor head fell off further and rotated a little more. So a lot of it, a lot of it at the end, very little in the middle, a whole lot of it in supination. So what, what am I saying? You hit the ground, you go into pronation, you heat, reach the end of pronation. Then you want to try to resupinate. What is trying to resupinate you? What's trying to resupinate you is an external rotation of the leg. The stance phase leg is in front of the trunk of the body. The trunk of the body is about to pass the stance phase leg. As it does so, it externally rotates the thigh, which externally rotates the tibia, trying to externally rotate the talus. But with the downward pressure of the body, you can't externally rotate the talus against the tilted anterior facet. So it's not until we get into supination that external rotation can occur. And what happens when you externally rotate? The sinus tarsi opens up. This is why you could put in a titanium implant in a sinus tarsi to block pronation. Do you ever wonder why those implants don't destroy the bone? You put titanium against bone, who's going to win? Titanium. Why don't they destroy the bone? Because there's not so much of a compressive force on the implant as there is a restriction to transverse plane rotation that occurs in supination that has to occur before the foot collapses. And that's why those implants have a tendency to hold the arch up. What is the locking mechanism? And what is the purpose of the subtalar axis? The locking mechanism is the head of the talus sitting on a level facet. What is the, pur what is the purpose of the axis? Locking and unlocking. It's like a window latch. When the two windows become level, the latch can come over and lock the window. It's a locking and unlocking mechanism that occurs primarily in supination, in the supination end of the range of motion, not the pronation. So motion of this around the subtalar axis is not a one-to-one -one with pronation and supination of the foot. That we know. But what's interesting is it's at the end of the range of motion that we start experiencing pathology and tissue stresses. Why? Because as the foot collapses and you reach the end of the range of motion, the ligaments tighten up. Tiny tears occur in the ligaments. These tiny tears become, add up to symptoms. The tissue stress theory states that if you cause microtrauma faster than you can heal, you develop a symptom. If you cause microtrauma slower than you can heal, no symptomatology. So what happens? At the end of the range of motion is where the microtrauma is occurring. So it's at the very end of pronation that we see pathology starting to occur and patients present to your office with symptoms. I'm going to ask you an interesting question. If you were in a car going 100 miles an hour and you were on the goal line, of a football field and on the opposite goal line there was a stone wall. Would you wait until you were half on the 50 yard line to apply your brakes? No. You would start applying your brakes as early as possible and yet knowing that we're heel strike and supination we cast the foot in neutral. We allow the foot to pronate all the way to neutral before even considering controlling its motion. It doesn't make any sense. So we cast, we wait till it's here before we even think about controlling it. Then we send it to the lab and what do they do? They fill in the arches. They arch fill the orthotic and they wait till you're on the 20 yard line before applying your brakes. I wouldn't do that. I would want to start applying the brakes here 
so that if we ever did hit the wall, hopefully we wouldn't, if we ever did hit it, we'd hit it gently, not with the impact forces that would cause micro trauma, tears, inflammation, and symptomatology. So what I'm going to propose to you is a classification of postural positions of the foot as illustrated by where that subtalar axis is in its role from heel strike to full pronation. Now, this is the role I'm talking about, the subtalar axial translation, not rotation. It's at the end of the range of motion that we see pathology occurring. That's where your tissue stresses occur. I call that the pathologic zone for that reason. Above that is a zone where the talus is attempting to externally rotate, but very little rotation can actually occur. That zone I'm going to call the dysfunctional zone. Why dysfunctional? Because there's very little rotation around the subtalar axis. It's primarily translation. But if you made an orthotic in the dysfunctional zone, what would happen? The foot would drop down and slam against the orthotic with every step. The repetitive impact of hitting the orthotic would end up causing so much pain, you would send the orthotic back for a, as a warranty to the lab. And I can tell you, I've been in the lab business now 13 years. You could put your warranties on one hand, your profits on the other. When your warranties go up, you lose money. When your warranties go down, you make money in this business. Above that is where the, sub, where the subtalar joint will actually do its rotation, its work, where it locks and unlocks. That's the functional zone of subtalar joint translation, a foot posture. Above that, some people have a zone that puts them in so much supination, your downward force moves lateral to the ankle, and you end up with a high incidence of inversion ankle sprains. I would call that the supination instability zone. So we go through all of these zones with every step we take. We hit the ground, we have the supination instability, functional, dysfunctional, and pathologic zone with every single step. How does that look statically? Like this. Pathologic, dysfunctional, functional, supination instability. Where is our friend neutral? Neutral happens to be right in the dysfunctional zone. So if you made an orthotic in neutral, you know what would happen? You'd end up sending it back as a warranty. The labs don't like warranties. So how do we solve that problem? What the labs do is they fill in the arches. What is the science behind arch fill? Does anyone know? I recently sent my uh, director of research to an F, to an F scan lecture at ProLabs. And Dr. Paul Shear was giving a lecture, introducing everybody to his lab because, and giving a tour. And my director of research, Dr. Stu Curry, raised his hand and he said, Dr. Shear, what is the science behind Archfill? And he said, well, I divide my customers into those that get it, those that kind of get it, those that don't get it. If you get it, you're sending in low arches, you don't need Archfill. If you kind of get it, you're sending in medium arches, he puts in medium Archfill. And if you don't get it, you're sending in big arches and he puts a lot of Archfill. In other words, there is no science. Nobody checks, I don't get it. <laughs> when they hire the lab. So what does the lab do? What have they just done by filling in the arch? What was the real purpose of filling in the arch? The high impact orthotics were coming back as warranties. When we lower the arch into the pathologic zone, what occurs? As you're reaching the end of the range of motion of the pronation, you're tightening up the ligaments. Tightening the ligament slows down pronation. Then you hit the orthotic. You begin to compress the soft tissues on the bottom of the foot. It dampens the final impact of pronation itself. Dampening that impact is enough to take you from just above the threshold of pain